Welcome to Zashi. I actually have my colleague here, Ramsey. Welcome, Ramsey. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be working with Ramsey just to understand how his current project is going and he's going to walk us through um, everything. So, Ramsey, um, how, how long have you been here at Zashi? Mm, thank you very much for this opportunity, first of all. Uh, I've been working with Zashi now for about two years. Yes. Right. Yeah. I know you guys finally have a project you, 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 you're working on. Can you pretty much walk us and walk me through how the project is going and what is the project all about? Okay, so um, I'm currently working with this customer called um, Royal Imports Export. Nice. And this customer, um, we were tasked with this project where we have to actually help um, build an application, a web-based application for this customer. Nice. And this customer, um, they're basically handling um, goods in terms of importing and exporting these goods. Yeah. So this application was a web-based application that will help customers to put in requests for goods they want to import or goods they want to export. Yes. Right. Um, first of all, this was a Java web-based application. So this company, they were making use of Java as their runtime. Okay. Right. And in this company, they actually had GitHub as an online repository where they stored all their application files. Nice. Right? So we're brought in now, we had to come up with like um, a CI CD process that will help this customer to actually um, integrate this application, build the application, and then deploy this application onto their AWS environment. Oh, nice. So you guys actually do make use of um, AWS? Yes, that's right. That's right. We actually make use of um, AWS to host these applications. So for the, the application, um, how many environments do you guys actually manage for this um, application? Uh, for this application, actually, uh, we have uh, various environments. Okay. Right. Um, for this one, we're actually making use of ECS for the environment where we're going to be deploying this application. So we have to containerize this application and then deploy it onto our ECS um, containers. Nice. So the environment you guys have like Dev, QA Prod, Dev oh, QA Stage and all that? Uh, definitely. So for our environment setup, we have um, a Dev, we have a QA and a, a production stage. So it has to go through like the Dev environment, the um, QA environment before it ever gets onto that um, production level. Nice. So what is actually um, the benefits having to make use of pipelines to manage this entire process? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that because a lot of people actually don't know this. Um, think about the various steps. As you can see, there are various steps that are involved to actually building an application before the application is ready to be posted onto our environment. Nice. Um, think about handling these steps individually, right? There's a lot of time and resources that has to be put into this. And there's a lot of human error that can come into these various processes. But setting up a pipeline like this that will help you automate the entire process is very advantageous. First of all, it takes the workload off your team and then um, it takes away that human error too since a lot of these are managed by certain um, companies. Beautiful. Um, you, you spoke about the company, um, you spoke about the various tools and what you guys were um, using for your infrastructure. Um, do you mind walking us through the process? Yeah, so um, I'm going to share um, with you here a, a pipeline, a CI CD pipeline that we made use of GitHub Actions to actually um, provision this pipeline and deploy uh, onto our AWS environment. So the first thing is that uh, our various developers that we have on our company, on our uh -huh. team, they are making use of Git on their local to actually communicate with the online repository. It's not about the team, about developers. How do you guys do this work? Is it done um, through the use of Agile? Do you guys make use of the waterfall methodology? How is the work actually being done and managed? Okay, thank you again. So we use the um, Agile methodology in our environment. Okay. So we work as a scrum team. Nice. Where we have like we work in sprints to deliver um, at the end of the sprint. And okay. On, during the sprints, we have like stand-up meetings to communicate that continuous communication about the project, making sure that everybody is going at pace and everything. Nice. So, um, like I was saying, for this project, um, our developers were using Git on their local to actually communicate with the online repository. We had all of the application files on a GitHub online repository, and that's where we're managing the application files. So each developer, when they're communicating with this repository to perform certain tasks or maybe write some code, um, 
to update something in the application, they actually have to create a feature branch. Each of them has to create a feature branch on the online repository. Excuse me. And they will communicate with this online repository using Git so they can push those um, application files when they are done on their local, they can push those application files onto the feature branch. And once this is done now, they can perform a pull request, right? So at this level now, it is not automatically, the, de the developers do not have the permissions to just push um, their code onto the dev branch because at this level, our team lead has to come in here and he does a code review. Okay. There are certain security fee measures that we have to go through to make sure these developers are not hard coding any values nice. within the code and stuff like that. So they have to perform a code review at this level before the pull request is permitted and it can be merged onto our dev branch. That's beautiful. I've actually been in scenarios where without code reviews, some um, team members have pushed things into our repositories and they have a lot of hard-coded stuff and secrets embedded in code, which has caused a lot of issues. Um, one of my previous companies I actually worked in, there was a scenario where our entire system got hacked because of stolen credentials which was gotten from the GitHub repository. So that's very good that you guys are doing something like yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, definitely in all environments now, this is something that is highly recommended nice. because you don't want to expose those um, sensitive information on your online repository. Nice. You, you spoke about the developers um, writing, um, pushing files and all of that. Um, what are some of those things that um, is being expected from these developers as you guys continue with the process of doing the application? So um, the files that are actually expected from the developers, first of all, we're going to need the developers to provide us with the source code. Okay. Right, the actual Java code. The actual Java code for this application. Okay. We're going to ask these developers to provide us with a test script. Test script, okay. Right? Okay. Because this is going to be used to test the code for vulnerabilities and stuff like that okay. to make sure it's good. And then we're going to actually make recommend them to the pom.xml file to provide us with the pom.xml file okay right. so what is the purpose of the pom so okay i'm going to come to that because during our build process uh -huh. we're going to be making use of maven to actually build this application okay. this is a java based application so we'll make use of maven to build the application and maven runs using a pom.xml file that is why the pom.xml file is a requirement for us right yeah. so this is what is required of our developers then uh, me as the engineer there are some other files that i had to provide right for example i had to provide the docker file okay like i said this application has to be containerized oh. so i had to come up with a docker file because we're going to be using docker to containerize this application before deploying it onto our ECS environment. Nice, nice, nice. Right, I had to come up with the Docker file. And actually here, I also had to have a task definition. Okay. Right. The task definition of JSON file? The right? JSON file. Oh. Right. right. This, is, this will be very interesting. It's a little bit confusing, but this is a requirement when we want to deploy onto our ECS yes. environment. Okay. Right. Good. So these are our files that are expected for um, to be in our um, repository before we can kickstart the process. But then now, coming now to kickstart the process is one very important thing that we need. How is GitHub Actions going to run? <laughs> GitHub Actions makes use of a workflow file. We call it a workflow file. And this file has to be stored in a specific directory called .github slash workflow. Okay. And this file is basically just a YAML file. Let's say, for example, let's just call this file ecs.yaml. Okay. And it's just a YAML file that holds instructions on how you want GitHub Actions to actually perform this build process. The building, the deployment, and everything. Everything that all the tasks you want GitHub Actions to perform for you, you're going to specify all of that within your YAML file. So I've seen a couple of different companies uh, make use of CISD tools um, like um, Jenkins. I've also seen other companies make use of other CISD tools. So why did you guys actually decide to go with the use of um, GitHub Actions? So um, currently in our environment, we always try to, first of all, we try to adopt a serverless infrastructure. Nice. Because there are a lot of advantages that come with a serverless infrastructure. First, it's not managed by you. Yeah. So you're not in charge of any updates. You're not in charge of any patching or anything like that. You don't have to worry about that. 
um, AWS or for example on this in this case GitHub is actually going to manage all of that for you in the back end. Okay. So GitHub Actions has the option to be a serverless, okay. right? So you could make use of a serverless runner. Okay. Right? What is a runner? A runner is simply the server that is used in the back end to perform your various tasks that you specify in your YAML file. Nice. Right? So it has that option for you to provision a serverless runner that you don't have to worry about it or anything. But on the other hand, Jenkins, for example, Jenkins, you have to have a Jenkins server that you have to yes. manage. You have to be in charge of updating it, patching it and stuff like that. Yeah. So you see, it relieves you of all that stress. And secondly, it's very cost effective, Good. right? Nice. Once the runner is done performing your job, the runner is discarded, so you don't have to pay for anything um, regarding it again. But with Jenkins, your um, Jenkins server is always running and consuming resources, so nice. that's not very cost efficient. Nice. So, can you walk us through the process of um, that um, the workflow file? What was what was in that workflow file? I know that the dynamics or everything was done there. What did actually happen to that? Okay. Uh, so for this workflow file, which is the very beautiful thing about GitHub Actions, is that this workflow file could be considered your entire pipeline. Yes. Because everything that you want to be done within your pipeline, from the building, the containerization, and the deployment, it can all be done by GitHub Actions within this workflow file. So this workflow file can be considered your entire pipeline. The very first thing you want to specify in this workflow file, I had to specify that I want my dev branch to be monitored. Okay. This is so that on uh, any situation where a merge is done onto this dev branch is going to kickstart this process okay. and then um, perform an update and deploy that update into our AWS environment. Remember, this is an event-driven um, oh, process, okay. so yes. it's entirely automated. We don't come in, I don't have to come in at any level to do anything unless it, run, it runs into an error. Okay. 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 It's an entirely automated process. And what kickstarts the process, like I say, is any merge that is done onto this branch that is being monitored. Okay, so when the merge has been done um, to that branch, automatically kicks up GitHub Actions to start the process. Yes, and GitHub Actions. That's, 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 that's very interesting. That's very, yeah, it's very beautiful. Do you actually have to define the kind of runner that you want GitHub Actions to make yourself? Yes, that's okay. right, right? That's the very next thing that you have to mention here. Yeah? Okay. The very next thing you mentioned is what kind of runner do you want to use? For yes. example, we could use Ubuntu okay. as our runner oh. for this process, okay. right? Yeah. And we specify we want it to be a managed server. Yeah. Like I said, give up, give up actions can be serverless, but it can also be server-based, yeah. right? If you want um, to manage the server that is going to be used for this job, you can do that. Oh. But we always try to go with the serverless option. So um, that's what we do. We just specify the runner. Oh. The next thing that we're going to do actually is we are going to specify here the jobs. Okay. What are the various tasks that we want GitHub Actions to perform? That's what we have to then specify here. Okay. Right? There's also something very good about GitHub Actions that I'll mention to you is GitHub Actions makes use of what we call actions. Okay. Actions are pre-built functions that are found on the GitHub Marketplace. Okay. And you can just call those functions within your workflow and those functions can perform certain tasks for you. Okay. So you're saying that, let me say for example, I need to do like a git clone and all of that. I could simply just pull an action from the marketplace that can do that for me. That can do that. So exactly. Okay. That's right. Good. So I was thinking there are various ways that I made use of actions here. So for example, like you just mentioned, the very first thing I want to do is I want to do like a git clone. Okay. Right. So that within this my runner, it's able to pull all my files that are found in my online repository because it needs to make use of these files for this process. So you pull all these files within the runner okay. and it's actually going to uh, make use of these files for the process, right? And for to do this, you can use GitHub, um, a GitHub action, an okay. action on the marketplace, you can use it to do that. The next thing is you want to build with Maven. Okay. But before you build with Maven, Maven has certain dependencies that it needs to run. You need to install Java on that server. You need to install Maven on that server before it's able to make use of Maven to actually build with it. So that's another thing that we can use a GitHub action to do. We can call another action and it's going to set up our environment, okay. right? It's going to set it up with like Java, install Java on that server and install Maven and set it up 
ready for you to use. And then we can go ahead now and perform the build with Maven. And this build makes use again of this pom.xml file. Oh, I was saying. so you're saying that Maven actually uses this pom.xml file to do that build process? That's right. Okay. Maven reads instructions from this pom.xml to do the build. Nice. And like I said, now you there are various things that you specify within that Maven, uh, within the pom.xml file. How do you want to, to do the build? Um, you want to use JUnit maybe for unit testing or SonarCube to test. Nice. Or if you want to push it to like a Nexus repository, yeah. once it's done, you can all specify that in your pom.xml file. Nice. So as part of the pom.xml, um, I see that there are a lot of dependencies and, and, and everything, right? That, that's, that's wonderful. But one question I have is, how do you call the action in that workflow? How are you guys calling the action from the GitHub Marketplace into your workflow? So, we, there are two options when it comes to using your jobs. Okay. There are two things you could specify. First is run, and the next is uses. Okay. Run is used to actually pass in shell commands that you want to run on these runners, okay. and uses is used to call actions from the marketplace. This is used for shell commands. Okay. And this is used to call actions. So you just use uses to call that specific action from the marketplace and make use of it within your runner. Huh. You're talking about Maven, um, building with Maven. We spoke about Maven making use of the problem that XML. So what happens during that build process? So during that build process, right, uh, we're going to specify, hey, uh, maybe we want to run um, an NVM package, okay. right? And NVM package, what does the NVM package does? It, first of all, is going to compile your code, okay. right? It's going to validate it. It's going to perform unit tests, and then it's going to package it now into an artifact. Okay, nice, right? nice. So that's what goes on through during the Maven process. And like I said, it uses this pom.xml to do all of that. So you have the package created, um, what happens after that? Okay, since I have the package created, remember I want to containerize this application, Okay. right? So that's the next step. Okay. The next step is I'm making use of Docker to actually containerize this application. But again, before using Docker, what do you need? You need to install Docker within your yes. runner, okay. right? So I'm going to call in another action. I'll say uses and I'll call in an action for Docker. Okay. And this action is going to install Docker on my runner and set up that environment ready for Docker to um, do its task. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I've actually realized the difference between GitHub Actions and GitLab CI, um, when you when you look at them, the difference is that GitLab CI doesn't actually have this aspect of making use of the uses and calling actions and all those things. Yeah, GitLab so, Actions, it seems like it's really wonderful. I mean, yeah, that's a very beautiful feature because, I mean, this file would be a very long file yeah. if I had to set up each of these things by myself. Right? Nice, nice. It would be a very long file. So this is a very um, good advantage that comes with GitHub Actions. So how does Docker actually containerize that, that artifact? Okay. Now, um, onto the process to containerize with Docker. Docker reads from the Docker file. Okay. So Docker makes use of your Docker file to containerize the application. So you're passing instructions within your Docker file, right? So what do you want your Docker to do? Everything will be specified in your Docker file. And what's the very first thing that comes in your Docker file? It's your base image. Okay. Before to build out a new image, you always make use of a base image. Uh -huh. So for this um, application, since this was a Java web-based application, we had Tomcat as a dependency okay. that we we're making use of. Uh -huh. But then there is a base, there is an, already an image of Tomcat, right, that is found on Docker Hub. Yes. Right. So what I did is within my Docker file, I just pull in that image from that Tomcat image as from Docker image. Hub, right? Yeah. And then I copied now my artifact which was created by Maven and then I bundled it up using on um, that base image for Tomcat bundled it up now and created now my new image with my application that's 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 wonderful so the end product um for all of this is actually that image yes the end product for all of this now is your containerized image good right all right the next steps now I'll put a little demarcation here okay because now these next steps are to be done within your AWS environment. Okay. 
All of these steps were actually done on the runner, but now the following steps are going to be done within your AWS environment. Okay. So you're saying that GitHub Actions has the ability to authenticate into the AWS environment and do other things. Yes, which is what I'm about to explain to you right now. Okay. Right? Yes. Because first of all, GitHub Actions is an external resource from your AWS environment. Yeah. If you're acquainted with AWS, you know that anybody who is trying to access the AWS environment externally, you need authentication first. Nice. And then you need authorization, the right permissions to make use of certain services. Nice. That's what we have to do here. What are the two tasks that GitHub uh, has to do? GitHub has to push our image to ECR. That's the first thing we want to do because we're making use of ECR to store the image. Okay. The second thing is we want to deploy to, to our ECS environment that we created. Okay. But like I said, before doing these two tasks, we need to authenticate GitHub Actions into our environment. How do we authenticate GitHub Actions? We make use of something called OIDC. Okay. Nice. Open ID Connect, right? Uh, some of you might be surprised um, because here I'm thinking, a lot of you might be thinking, hey, I'm going to make use of access keys and secret access keys, but that is not a security best yeah. practice. Start the credentials. Right? Call. Security is very important for all of us as engineers, so okay. that's something that we really have to pay attention to. So we don't want to make use of static credentials, like you said. We want to make use of Open ID Connect. It's a more secure option. Okay. How does Open ID Connect work? Okay. Open ID Connect works by exchanging metadata between your two environments. Okay. When you exchange metadata between these two environments, it creates some kind of a trust relationship, okay. right? Like both parties, right? Between both parties. Now, your um, GitHub repository on GitHub Actions has a uh, trust with your AWS environment and vice versa. Nice. That's how that works. But remember, this is just authentication. Now for the authorization part, we made use of a role. Yeah. GitHub Action is actually going to assume a role and that role has now the permissions for ECR and the permissions for our ECS environment. That's true. Then it's able to perform this action. So GitHub Action is actually being like an like 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 an, like an identity. Yeah, on its own. Yeah. Nice. That's, nice. that's something very beautiful. Good, good. Okay, like I was saying now, the next step is to push to ECR. Yeah. Now what's the beautiful thing about ECR? ECR comes with image scanning by default. Okay. If you're making use of a private repository on ECR, you can enable image scanning as well as encryption. So those are some security features that come with it. That was why we decided to make use of um, ECR because when once we push our image onto our ECR um, registry or our ECR repository, AWS makes use of the AWS inspector Okay. to scan that image for vulnerabilities before it stores that image on that repository. Nice. Right? So it inspects, it scans that image before storing it on our ECI repository. Okay. Uh, beautiful. So does, does GitHub, does, does the GitHub Actions, um, when it actually containerizes that, that image, does it do some kind of, um, does it do some kind of tagging of the image? Okay, that's very good that you ask, right? Yeah. We always want to tag the image because, okay, this is an automated process, so it's going to happen over and over. Oh. We want some kind of tag so we are able to identify that, hey, this um, was run on this specific date and stuff like that, okay. right? So um, there's actually an, um, another option that comes with GitHub where we're able to use the build number. Okay. For each build that runs on GitHub, it has a unique build number. Okay. And then we're able to make use of that build number to tag okay. that image yes. together with like the date okay. and the time, okay. right? That build number contains like the date and the time. So you are, you are easily able to identify when this image was produced, oh, right? Beautiful. So that's how we use um, to tag that image. Okay. Oh, that's good. So the next thing now to do is we want to deploy onto our ECS environment from GitHub Actions, okay. right? This is our ECS environment. Okay, thank you for that. This is our ECS cluster. For our cluster, we know cluster makes use of two options. Oh. We have a serverless option and a server-based option. Like I said before, we always try to go with a serverless option. So we're actually making use of Fargit for our ECS cluster. Oh, so is, is, is Fargit one, 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 um, one thing that is used on AWS for um, orchestrating these containers and all of that? 
Exactly. So it's right? kind of like similar to the Docker Swarm and Kubernetes kind of thing. Exactly. All oh, right. So ECS uses Fargate to orchestrate your containers and manage how they run. All oh. right. Oh. Then within our cluster, we want to create a service. Okay. And within a service now will help us manage our various tasks. Okay. And within our task, we have various containers running our image. Okay. Right? Why do we have to have so many layers, you might ask? Right? These layers provide us um, that um, extra scalability that we need for our applications. Right? First of all, our scaling, our service comes with auto scaling. Okay. So it's able to scale this task. We're able to say, hey, if um, incoming traffic is really high, I want you to provision three more tasks okay. with two more containers in each task, okay. right? So that we can handle traffic efficiently, um, even if um, traffic goes up. And it's able to scale down as well to provision for costs if um, we're not receiving a lot of traffic. So that's a very good thing about um, ECS as well. Okay. And the service makes use of a load balancer, as you can see here, this is my <coughs> elastic load balancer and um, I'll actually integrate this with my various um, containers that are running on my task right I'll put all of this in a target group and my load balancer is able to distribute traffic on those underlying containers so the service actually registers this task in the target group for you yes it okay. does uh, it, um, the service does um, all of that for you so the service kind of handles on um, the networking part of CS all right. so one thing I want to ask is how does GitHub Actions actually deploy to that, that, that service? How does it update the service? How has that been done? Thank you very much for that. That's why I'll bring you back to the task definition. Remember we specified the task definition here. Okay. Right? As we know, there are, very, there are three very important components of ECS. Okay. We have the cluster, which I've mentioned. Yeah. We have the service, but the third very important um, component I did not mention was the task definition. I'm kind of like very new to, to ECS. When you talk about the cluster, are you simply just talking about maybe the, the server, the server environment where these, these tasks are going to run? Excellent. You okay. have the right idea. Okay. Right? Yeah. The cluster simply provides the compute power, okay. right? Where is your containers that need to run? Where are they receiving compute power from? The underlying server that these containers are going to run on. That is what the cluster simply is. That's why I said we have two options. We have, a, we have Fargate, which is the serverless option. And we have EC2. We can actually make use of EC2 where it's going to provision these servers and we can see the servers and log into them, manage them and all of that. But like I said, you know, with that comes um, the responsibility of patching and updates fall on you. We don't want we want to reduce all of that workload, so we go with the serverless option. Nice. So definitely, it means that um, this you have to specify a network where this is going to be deployed on. Correct. Excellent. Okay. We have to specify the whole network because these are basically easy to instances. So all of this you can think of it as being within a VPC. A VPC. Oh, beautiful. That's good. Nice. You can think of it as being within a VPC, right? Yeah. So that's how this is set up. Then as for the service, right? The service, remember the service is able to uh, provision new tasks for you and new containers running that. Yeah. Now, how does the service know what containers to provision, what image to use and all of that? The service makes use of the task definition. It reads all of those instructions from the task definition. Yeah. So within the task definition, we specify things like what image do you want to run within the container? What portion of the compute power do you want to allocate within your containers? What amount of co um, containers do you want to run within a task? No, All of that is specified within the task definition. So I'm actually going to assume that the task definition is related to kind of like a Docker Compose kind of thing, where you actually define what the container actually needs to run, right? The environment okay. variables, the container name like and things like that. Oh, perfect, that's perfect. Good. That's it. Yeah. Right. One other important thing: you specify maybe a service role, oh. right, or a task role. Well, because we are talking about this now. This might be the back end layer of our application. What if this back end needs to access a database? Oh, okay. Right. Yes. We have to allocate a role to this yes. so that it's able to have permissions to access that database. Oh. Right. All of that we specify in 
the task definition. All right. So does GitHub Actions just walk me through the process on how it makes to the task definition? Okay, so I was about to come to that. So for your task definition now, you can export your task definition as a JSON. Okay. AWS gives you that option where you just translate it into a JSON file and you can download that file. You upload that file within your repository, right? Yeah. What was the first thing I said um, was um, in your task definition, the image that you want to run, you specify uh, the location of that image. So that is what um, GitHub Actions leverages to actually deploy to your cluster. Okay. It comes to your task definition and where you specify the image, it updates it after it pushes that image into ECR. Yeah. It updates that image um, URI, for example. It updates the image URI and specifies now the image URI for the new image it just uploaded into ECR. Nice. It does that now, so it creates a new, um, so you have a new task definition.json file. Yeah. It comes within your task definition, it creates a new version, okay. and the new version has the new image, and then it triggers your service to run and do an update while reading now from the new task definition. So now your service will now be provisioning the new uh, the new image. Nice, right? nice. One thing about the service too is the service, you have two deployment strategies that you can make use of with the service. You have a canary deployment strategy and you have a rolling update, right? In my environment, we make use of the rolling update so it's able to update um, one container at a time as nice. it goes, right? Nice. So we don't experience any downtime for it. So that's how GitHub Actions actually perform, perform that. And for the entire infrastructure now, uh, I, I front my application, my application infrastructure, I front that with a CloudFront to provide that um, extra uh, low latency, to provide low latency for us. Okay. And then I use Route 53, for example, to uh, map Domain. My, my domain name onto this IP. Nice. You, you spoke about this entire infrastructure. Um, so just tell me what database um, are you guys making use of? Um, do the task definitions talk to a password of database? Yes. So for example, uh, actually for this project, uh, we're making use of an RDS MySQL database. Okay. So we have to give, so the task definition, for example, we have to say, uh, we have to give it a role, okay. right? It's going to assume a role that has permissions for this RDS database to then access information within this database. Because when orders are processed, it stores this, it stores these orders within our database. Oh, that's good. Thank you so much, Ramsey. This was a wonderful session. Thank you for walking us through GitHub Actions and uh, make us understand how your project actually looks like. Thank um, you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It was a great pleasure um, sharing this with you guys. Thank you. Pleasure.